Well, good evening to each one of you. If you would, open to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15 is where we'll be focusing our, our thoughts this evening. Thankful for the presence of all, especially those who are visiting with us. In Luke chapter 15, I want us to start off here with the first two verses. We're going to look at this chapter as we go through this evening. But it says in verse 1, Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. You know, as we talked about this morning when we discussed boldness and and courage, you'll notice that Jesus is not a man who lets men's viewpoints distract him from what he believes is right. As you'll notice here in chapter 15, whenever he has the tax collectors and sinners, the people that are looked down on in society, they're coming to him, interested in what he has to say, the Pharisees are over there and the scribes are grumbling. They're upset about this because <coughs> basically they, <coughs> they had this policy where they just looked down on it. That these people were unwilling to, or these people were unacceptable to receive these blessings. They had, tr- they had treated them in that way. And when you look at Jesus here, as he is looking, he isn't concerned about personalities. He isn't concerned about financial status or anything like that. But he is concerned about people's souls. He's concerned about his purpose. Like in Luke chapter 19, he said that he came to seek and save that which was lost. Turn to Matthew chapter 9. As you hold this verse here, Matthew chapter 9. We're going to come back to Luke. But in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus knew his purpose. And really, as you think about those that were negative around him, he wasn't going to let their bad attitude cramp his style, basically, to to stop what he knew was right. And in Matthew chapter 9, here in verse 10, you have a similar situation where you have the man that comes in, he's lowered through the roof, and he tells them, hey, your sins are forgiven you. And they ask, who is this man to even forgive sins? And you'll notice here, picking up in verse 10, then it happened, as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, this is the next scene, Behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? And this helps to give us reason of why Jesus does this. In verse 12, But when Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You know, the truth is, the group that he was talking to, they were just as much sinners as the others. But whenever he's talking here about the sinners versus the righteous, it's how they viewed themselves. When you think about the tax collectors and the sinners, they came to Jesus knowing what he offered, and they appreciated that. They wanted to come so that they would be healed. Well, what he does over there... In Luke chapter 15, as he goes through four different examples, he tells four different, basically it's three stories, but he talks about four different people or or things that illustrate their bad attitude and about how they need to change their attitude. So what I want us to do tonight is to talk about four lost things, once I can get the slide to click. Four lost things. As you'll notice, there's four stories on the board. You've got the different stories that we'll be discussing this evening, and we'll step through each one of those. Hold your finger here. I want to get one more passage. Turn to Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, here in verse 4, we talked about this passage in a parallel in Matthew chapter 10. But I want us to just notice one thing. Because when we think about how we view the lost, how we view even those that are in our congregation that may have wandered away from the truth, sometimes people can slip through our fingers or they kind of gradually kind of work their way out. But as you'll notice, that's not how God, how God is. He is always conscious of his flock. And he gives some examples of how perceptive he is here when he's talking in Luke chapter 12. He says in verse 4, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more they can do, but I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he is killed, 
has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you to fear, I tell you, fear him. But in verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two cents? Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head, of course, it's a little bit easier with me, are all numbered. Do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Even just the sparrows that we can lose track of, there's, there's hundreds of them. Jesus knows, God knows every single one of them. And he's talking here about how even more with people, he's concerned about them. Well, let's go over there now to Luke chapter 15. Now, let's step through the first text here in verses 4 through 7. You'll notice as he goes through this story that he starts with something that is the least valuable, and he starts ascending in value as he goes through these different stories. But as he begins here in Luke chapter 15, here in verse 4, or let's pick up in verse 3. So he told them this parable. This is in response to what he discussed here in verses 1 and 2, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Let's talk about that sheep a little bit. When we talk here, the first lost thing is the lost sheep. And you'll notice, as Jesus is describing here, he, he brings up an illustration that all of them would know, uh, especially the shepherds, that if you had one lost sheep, you don't say, hey, well, I've got 99 sheep, I'll just leave that one to go off on its own. You're conscious even of just one single sheep. That might not be that, might not be that valuable. But as you'll notice here, he doesn't really lay out what specifically causes the sheep to, to stray, but... We'll put this in the category of wandering away. This sheep lost its way, whether it was by bad decisions or maybe by distractions. You know, sometimes with sheep, they're going through, maybe they're chasing down some thistles. They keep going through, and eventually they end up, they're off in the woods, and they're gone. They've slowly wandered away through some poor choices. Or perhaps they were led down the wrong path. Remember in Isaiah 53 and verse 6, he says, All we like sheep have what? gone astray, haven't we? As we think about people, when we think about why people walk away from the Lord, sometimes this is it. It's not that they are trying to be wicked. It's not that they're just interested in jumping off the cliff spiritually, but it is that they just wander away. They have uh, maybe a friend or maybe uh, some comrades that go through and influence them, and they start wandering away. Hold your finger here and turn over to James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, James talks about this same person that wanders away from the truth or strays from the truth and about the blessings of going and getting them. So when we think about why some people walk away, this can be one of the reasons that they wander from the truth or that they will walk away from the Lord. In verse 19, he says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. As you think about these passages, they convey that it's not out of malice, it's not necessarily out of greed and wickedness that this person has wandered away, but they have since gone away from the Lord. Well, back there in Luke chapter 15, he brings up just a simple illustration, and Jesus uses this in multiple places. But he goes through and talks about how just as a simple shepherd, you would go through and put in the time and the effort. You would go through and and you'd clear your schedule. Say, man, okay, I've got a sheep that's lost. I'm going to clear everything, and I'm going to go after that one sheep. He doesn't say, well, okay, I can wait a couple days, or uh, I can wait a couple weeks, and then I'll go find my sheep. He's like, no. I'll go leave the 99, and I will go immediately. As you'll notice there, he goes and he finds it in verse 4. And when he found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. 
Even though with all the, the stress and strain, it was still something that he was excited about. He was glad that it had happened, that he could bring his, his sheep back. But there in verse 6, he goes through and talks about how he had brought together his friends and neighbors, and he wanted them to rejoice with him. What it, the whole point is, is where the Pharisees and the scribes, they don't have this attitude toward the laws. Even someone that has incidentally wandered away, they're not interested in them. They wouldn't clear their schedule. And then if they happen to come back, well, okay, maybe that's what they should have already been doing, which is true, but their heart wasn't in it. They didn't have that compassion for the lost that Jesus had, and they don't rejoice when they come back. So with all that being said, he mentions the point, though, in verse 7, because the story he's trying to draw is something even greater. In verse 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Have you ever read that verse in verse 7 and been like, man, what's going on? This person's been righteous. You got 99 that are in the bank, but yet there's more joy over one that has come back. You know, sometimes we can go through and we kind of actually uh, have this, we kind of have the, uh, this attitude that says, well, okay, I've been doing this for however long, I've been, I've been keeping it, and those are great things. But then it's like whenever we come into a situation with Luke 15, we just say, well, you know, how, how, come, I'm, how come I'm not being more patted on the back? Well, I think probably one thing that helps us to understand this is actually, uh, if I remember right, this is Joe's favorite verse, is to have the attitude that we are all unprofitable servants. It's the idea that we are just doing what is required of us. When we think in Luke chapter 15, the blessings are being with the flock. The blessings are being with the shepherd. So when we think about that attitude, we need to, to remove that because that's the attitude that they have. Well, that's the first thing that you'll notice here. That the sheep here wandered away. That was the first lost thing. But also continue on to the second lost thing. That is the story of the lost coin. This one was lost by carelessness. In Luke chapter 15, here in verse 8. In Luke 15, here in verse 8. He says, Or what woman, if she has ten silver coins and loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I had lost. In the same way, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. As you look at this one, it's a little bit different than a sheep. Where a sheep has its own will, it can kind of wander around and do its own thing. Whenever you lose a coin, that's not how it works, right? I mean, ladies, when's the last time you had one of the uh, pieces of your jewelry just jump off and start sprouting legs and run off? It may be coming off your necklace, but it's not going to run away on its own. So whenever you think about this, this is carelessness. Something has happened, whether it's uh, maybe a piece broke or uh, maybe it fell off the table. Whatever it was, it was neglect that led to the loss of this one. But whatever it took, she goes through, or whatever caused it, she goes through and puts in the effort to bring it back. Now, one thing I do want to bring up here in verse 8 is she talks about these ten silver coins. This is not like your, uh, your ten sets of quarters or anything like that, or even your ten sets of silver dollars. What these are, if I understand, is drachma, is maybe what some of the words you have. Mine says uh, silver coins. What these, uh, from my understanding, the wage is, uh, is that equal to about a denarius which a denarius is a day's wage for a usual laborer. So if we kind of put that in common terms, that's running around maybe $100 to $300. So she has this set of different coins, which that's going to be more than than just a sheep. So he's increasing in value. So it's not just, oh, okay, I lost my quarter and it rolled off and it's not that big of a deal. We're talking pretty big coin here, maybe a couple hundred dollars. So she goes through and she puts in the effort. She lights a lamp, she sweeps the house, and she searches carefully until she found it. Have you ever gone through? Maybe you're uh, like uh, Elena and me sometimes. I think we're pretty good about this, but maybe you have your wedding ring. 
And I hear stories about this sometimes. Maybe I'm trying to bring up something that someone's a little uncomfortable with. But maybe you lost your wedding ring or you've misplaced it. Well, is that on your mind? Absolutely. You ever run into somebody? I mean, they're saying, man, I can't find my ring. They're running all over the place, sweeping, going crazy because they know the value and and everything that's connected with that. Well, that's what this woman's doing. She realizes the value of it. Then whenever she gets it, again, she does the same thing that the man did earlier. Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin which I have lost. You know, the thing that Jesus is bringing up to these people is that in simple little things, just like sheep, just like coins, that they get excited about it. They are, they're willing to throw a party. Hey, everybody come over. I found my wedding ring, right? Which is a good thing. What about people's souls? Wouldn't that be even more valuable? That's, that's the thing that Jesus is driving at. And there in verse 10, he elaborates where he said in verse 7, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. As he says in verse 10, kind of in an abbreviated way, He says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. It's not only heaven, but there are angels that are consciously aware of where we are in our relationship to God. They are aware of where we are and that we are wandering away from Him. And they are excited whenever we come back. There's joy there in heaven. So with that being said, we have the wandering away and we have carelessness. But let's talk about the third lost, uh, third lost thing, being the younger son. This one was by rebellion. This isn't, oh, okay, the sheep just kind of got led away. This isn't something that I forgot on a table and then I came back and it was gone. This is straight up rebellion. This is the complete opposite. It wasn't carelessness. It wasn't a wandering away. It is, hey, I know which way I'm supposed to be going, and I don't really care. I'm going to go the other way. As you look at this story, picking up in verse 11, it is a complete, utter shameful thing that he does in regard to his father's inheritance. Let's pick up in verse 11 and read down through verse 24. And he said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, now let me, be, let me just stop for just a second. Remember, as we are increasing in value, the younger son was less valuable than the older son, right? Remember, the older son at the, in this culture received about twice the inheritance. They received half the inheritance, rather. So, again, increasing in value. So he says in verse 12, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no, and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger? I will get up and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, Quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found, and they began to celebrate. As you look at this story, there's some things, and you know, you've probably heard plenty of people do a whole lot better job with this text than I could. So I'm not going to go through every step of the prodigal son, but as you'll notice here, some basic things. Basically, what he was doing in chapter 15 
was he was wanting the things that were supposed to only come with the death of his father. I don't know if you could say necessarily he was wanting his father to die, but he definitely didn't have the patience to wait on the things that were going to be promised to him. He then goes and lives basically the life of 1 Peter 4. He's got to live the way of the world with the prostitutes and, and on and on and on. And he wasted everything. Which again, we don't know how much this could be, but when you look at what is being described, this could be a lot of money. Where if he would have gone through and maybe put it in investments, been like some of the good stewards in Matthew 25, he could have been set up. Because that was one of the things that, that fathers and mothers do for their kids from the book of Proverbs. So in humiliation, though, he repents and he come back, comes back to his father. Verse 17 says he came to his senses and realized, hey, being a servant in my father's house is a whole lot better than sitting here starving. I can go back and be with him. So we see in verse 18, he's get his speech lined up. He says, okay, I'm going to go back to my father, tell him how I've sinned against father in heaven. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And so he comes up. And his father's waiting on him. Father's looking there. He's been wanting him the whole time. You know, we don't know exactly, but you can see here a story that, or a picture that kind of presents that. He's been looking for him. He's been conscious of him the entire time he's been gone. Just like if Jude had wandered away, he wasn't talking to me anymore, obviously I'd be a little bit interested in the fact that he's coming back. Just like with any of us, with our children. And he goes through and he sees him. He feels compassion for him. He ran and embraced him and kissed him. He starts going into his speech in verse 21, and the father cuts him off. He starts giving him the things, not that the slaves wear, but that the sons wear. He brings out the best robe and puts it on him, the ring in his hand, the sandals on his feet, brings out the fatted calf, and they celebrate. Because that son, who hadn't lost his life, he had just been going and living the way that he wanted to, and come back into a good relationship with his father. Just simple things. So the response of the father, clearly it seems that he has been waiting day by day. He receives him with immense love and grace. And you'll see, he gives him the second chance. He doesn't hold it over him. He doesn't say, well, okay, you got 90 days probation. you got to go through and get out there with the pigs now. Take care of them. Of course, he's a Jew. He wouldn't have pigs. So, But take care of the animals. But as you think about the lesson, though, it's much more than even than what is described a little bit earlier in this text. Because while our relationships with our kids are very important, and while we think about here in Luke 15, I can imagine, you know, I'd be pretty angry that you had spent so much of my money. But when you think about the soul and about the everlasting consequences, even this story pales in comparison to the plan of salvation that the Lord offers to us. So as you think about this idea, you know, sometimes we feel like in this life, and uh, the message is just over and over again, live it up, right? Live it up. Spend your life living it up. But I'll tell you what happens so many times, is the people that go through and listen to the message of the world and live it up, they spend the rest of their life living it down because they made so many bad choices that they have to live with. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, Jesus poses the question that what is, what is it worth to you? Is it worth the world? Is your soul worth the world? And the truth is, the world is not worth the pain. And he realized that. Just in a very earthly way, not even a spiritual way, he realized that. So with that being said, that's our three ways so far that we've had lost things. But the sad thing for this father is while he gained one, he had another one that was lost within the same account. So let's talk about that older brother. He was lost by being unforgiving. In Luke chapter 15, let's continue the account this time in verse 26, or in verse 25. After they had begun to celebrate, verse 25 says, Now his older son was in the field. When he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. Again, talking just in a physical way. 
In verse 28, But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, for so many years I have been serving you, and I have never neglected a command of yours, and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live, or made alive, and was lost and has been found. I feel bad for this father. He has a whirlwind of emotions in one day. He goes through and he has one son that he's been away. He's conscious of him. I mean, this isn't just like, hey, okay, I'll send you a couple emails or give you a phone call every once in a while. If you're off in a foreign country, you don't hear from them for sometimes months unless they're in constant written communication. So he doesn't have really any contact, and then his son finally comes back. And then he goes through and he has to deal with another son that's doing just as wrong in a way. Yeah, it's more socially acceptable. Yeah, it looks better on the surface, but it's still just as evil, isn't it? Is it not just selfishness in both ways? Wherein this man, he goes off and he wants to go and to have his own things and do all of that. Where this man, he's just concerned about his self and his reputation. As you think about this, the unwillingness of the father or the brother to forgive is exactly what was happening with the Pharisees. Yeah, they had done the right things, just like this older son had. They had been there, they'd been studying the law, they'd been teaching the law, they hadn't been like the world, but yet they had the wrong attitude toward their brother. The father rebukes him and tells him that he should want to see repentance. And he commended him, though, for his continued faithfulness. So as you think about this concept, it's very sad for for this man because he's got so many good things going for him, but yet he doesn't have a true compassion on people. In just normal terms, we would understand that there's a problem in his house, but on a spiritual way, we have a very ugly sin that comes out whenever we have a lack of compassion and care for other people, and we don't have a different attitude whenever they return. The father had the right attitude. The father was happy whenever his son came back. He threw the feast. He celebrated. He, he appreciated what had come back. And he was willing to bring back his other, brother, his other son to him. But yet, this older brother, who had been there with his father, had not learned the ways of his father. So let's make just a few brief applications. As we think about the text in Luke chapter 15, we consider, again, these four lost things, these four stories. Jesus is trying to teach us something. And as we think first off, we need to have the attitude that God has toward the lost, to be conscious of them, to have basically when someone's not here, when someone wanders away, be wondering, hey, where's that person at? What's been going on? What's happening in their lives? Is it something like this where some of these things have crept in? You know, the truth is we should never settle for having the majority saved. If you went through and you looked at this, even just on the pure numbers basis, you have 99 out of 100, then you have 9 out of 10, which that's not bad, then you kind of go down with 1 out of 2, 50%. But even then, sometimes people would say, well, all right, I got half of them, right? Truth is, God is never satisfied even when it's 1, 10, or 50%. It's not there. He's concerned about every single one. In 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, remember what he said, that he is interested in every person coming to repentance. Every single soul. It doesn't matter if you're purple, green, blue, black, yellow, red. It doesn't matter. He wants every single person with a soul to come back to him. But as you'll also notice, is that whether it's 
wandering away like the sheep, or maybe it's through carelessness, maybe it's through just straight-up rebellion or unforgiveness. It doesn't matter where you're at. Everybody can come back. It doesn't matter what sin you've done. It doesn't matter what your past is. The, the extending of the gospel is there for every single person. And the truth is, unless we want to be like this older brother, we need to be forgiving of every single person if there is true repentance. But I'll tell you one thing also that I think happens so many times in Brethren, and we, we talk about this whenever I first came, is about our attitude toward the lost, and specifically whenever they come back. Many times what happens is someone comes forward and they do a great thing, just like James. We come through and we just give them a pat on the back, we say, hey, appreciate you, made a great decision, and on and on and on, and then what do we do? That's it. We just go on, business as usual. Instead of, you know, being excited about the Super Bowl, or instead of being excited about our birthday, our Father's Day, right? You know, I had a special meal for my Father's Day, thankful for that. Why don't we have some type of celebratory thing whenever someone comes back and they save their soul from an eternal condemnation? It's a different attitude toward the loss, and it shows up in Luke 15 with these people, just in normal things. You lost a sheep, you lost a coin, you lost a son, you throw a party. What about someone that was going to lose their soul and turn back to the Lord? But the truth is as well, if we don't have the attitude of wanting other people to be forgiven of their sins, we're not going to be forgiven of ours either. And you can see this here. The older brother, he wasn't going to have his sins forgiven if he couldn't get over his pride and be willing to accept his brother. So as we think about these things, the applications, the message of Luke 15 is this. Everyone can repent, and everyone should be excited about it, right? So based off of all of this, we shouldn't let our preconceived ideas or our fears keep us from bringing joy into our lives and also the lives of others whenever they come back to the truth. If we say, well, okay, that person may just go right back into it. Okay, that'd be a problem, right? We need to deal with that. I'm not saying that's not a problem. But whenever they make the step back, you want to be excited about that. Whenever we go through, sometimes we condemn people in our mind before they ever go through the actions. You know, and I remember whenever I was in, in school, we talked about a thing. It was called self-fulfilling prophecy. What it was is you would go through and people would go into situations. They'd say, well, okay, they're coming up on a test, right? Right? And the person comes up and they say, man, I'm going to bomb this test. I'm just going to bomb this test. It's going to be terrible. They may have put in all this time, but they go through and bomb. They're just saying it again and again. Well, guess what happens? They walk into it and they bomb the test. Is it because they didn't study? No. It's because they had already decided in their mind how that was going to happen, how that situation was going to happen. Truth is, you think about, a, I think about great athletes. You know, they go through and they may have times where this may fail or whatever, but they never allow failure in their mind. They always think, hey, I'm coming up, bases loaded, two outs, bottom of the ninth, I'm going to get the winning hit. That's the attitude you have to have. It may not always happen, but again, the attitude that you have is completely different. If you go up there and you're just shaking with the bat and saying, man, I'm going to fail, of course you're going to fail. It's going to get blown right past you. It's a different attitude. And too many times what we do with people that come back is we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. We say, that person is just going to go back where they are, and guess what happens? They go back exactly where they are. Instead of wanting the best and trying to do differently to bring them back. So the message tonight is this. Whether you've wandered away, whether you've been lost by carelessness or by rebellion, or perhaps through unforgiveness, the method of repentance is still available. Where you can come back to the Lord. If you're not a Christian... Please respond to him. This is the merciful Father that is pictured here. Our Father that is consciously waiting for everyone to come back to him. Respond to him in the waters of baptism. Have your sins washed away. Repent and live a different life. And be glad to be with the Father and by his side. If you're a Christian, maybe you've fallen away in some other way. Do the same thing here. The Father is there. He's ready to accept you. Come back if you, if you need. We can help you at all. Come forward as we stand and sing.